I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Welcome. Today we're talking about um, what is often called functional medicine. Um, I like to call it lab-based brain chemistry because that's what I do. So um, there's really, like all of these lectures, there's really two steps. There's the assessment phase or diagnosis phase, and then there's the treatment phase, which is what are we going to do about the problem. And so in the assessment phase, what we do with people first is we want to know how is their brain chemistry and their body chemistry. Is it doing well? We are not necessarily looking for disease, although we are always keeping our eyes open for disease, and that's our first priority. But after we've eliminated disease, from the field, then we really begin to look at imbalances that have a lot to do with the person's life and lifestyle. So the first thing we do is an extensive history. We ask a bunch of questions about everything that has to do with their life, and we do that on paper and we do that verbally. And sometimes we ask a person to write that down. We ask them to write a narrative of their story where they write down what was wrong with them and when they first got sick and how they felt and what happened, and they tell their story because this can be very painful and it can be very detail-oriented. And some doctors won't sit and listen to that. So it's very useful for a patient in my world to write down everything that they want to tell me and get it all out and make sure that it goes in one place. And then we can look at it, we can highlight it, we can categorize it, we can chunk it up, we can build a timeline out of it, which is really important. Build a timeline of events. What happened first? What happened next? Did this cause that? Was this associated with that? And so those are very useful steps for us as we try to solve the mystery. After that, the next step is usually an old-fashioned complete blood count, a CBC. That is a um, measurement of all the types of cells that we measure in blood. So that's uh, done in children, it's done in adults, it's very easy, it's a simple tiny little needle in the arm, they, they take out some blood and even kids can handle it. Um, we have accurate information for children, so we can measure children as well as adults. And it will help us identify things um, that are medical and things that are also really non-medical, more functional and more lifestyle related and imbalances instead of pathologies. So. Um, when we do that, we are measuring the, all the different types of red blood cells, and we're measuring all the types of white blood cells of the immune system, and we're measuring the platelets, which are the, the, the clotting type cells that, um, that clot for you and that, that do a bunch of other things. So um, we also have another test besides the CBC, which is a blood test, called a, a, a biochemistry profile. And so in the old days, I'm calling the old days because, uh, you know, it seems like people don't do this anymore. Doctors don't really do a good physical exam anymore, and they really don't do a comprehensive lab panel. They do a spotted um, um, focal exam, which might be two or three things that are related to the chief complaint that the patient has. And then they'll do a, a, a focal uh, blood test that's just two or three things that are based on, again, the chief complaint. So they might order a cholesterol and some red cells and something, and that's it. And so um, what we're trying to do in holistic medicine is get a picture of the whole person's physiology. And these are not terribly expensive or invasive procedures. So um, a lot of people really want to do this. And, and you can do it by yourself. You can do it with a doctor. Uh, you can do it with a natural doctor, like a chiropractor or a naturopath or a, a medical doctor who does holistic work. You can also go to places like anylabtestnow.com. There's a bunch of different places that, that do that where you can order your own lab tests and you don't have to uh, have a doctor in order to order these tests. So now interpretation is another story, but at least you can order the tests and get the results and then shop them around to different doctors if you need to. And I think that is wise to get second opinions. And it's also wise to be able to get tests that your insurance may not let you order. Because when you go to your doctor, if you do it through insurance, there's a lot of third party pay barriers where if you think you've got something that you want to test, a doctor is going to be told, no, you can't do that because it's too expensive and it's not justified. There's not enough evidence that that will help find a disease that we will be able to help with. Well, most of my patients don't want uh, to look for disease. They've already done that. They're looking for the imbalance that is the real problem, and that's not usually a pathology. Um, sometimes it is, and sometimes we do find new pathologies, but not most of the time. Most of the time we find functional imbalances that are little known to the medical profession, but relevant to a patient, even though they're not pathologies, they're not diseases. So after we've done these blood tests, we've done the history and the interview, we've done the um, discussion of the patient's life and, and narrative, we've looked at their letter they've written, we've looked at their, we've constructed a timeline, then we've ordered the blood test, which was the CBC and the blood chemistry panel. Now that blood chemistry panel, what is it? 
the blood chemistry panel is a bunch of enzymes and a bunch of chemicals and a bunch of minerals that are in your blood, and we know what normals are. And so we're looking at that to look for first disease. And then after we know that it's not disease, we use that to look at imbalances. Now, when you look at blood tests, there are two ways to look at blood tests generally. One is the range, which I talked about earlier. There is a bell curve of distribution for values. Everything from your height and your weight to your red blood cell count to your cholesterol. And so each of those data points falls somewhere on that curve uh, to the right or left of average, which is right in the middle of that bell curve. You might have a very high score on something or a very low score or something very close to average or right in the middle of the average. So what we try to do in medicine is we try to find a barrier here where um, there's a line drawn that says on this side of that line, high or low is normal. And on the far side of the line, high or low is disease or pathology an abnormal, abnormal result. So um, that is the medical or laboratory range. And that varies a little bit from region to region based on how sick people are in different parts of the United States. But generally those ranges are pretty well known and, and they're discussed and they're in textbooks. Um, but they, they do vary a little bit. Then there's another range called the functional range. And the functional range is really the truly healthy range that a lot of doctors have talked about and discussed and said, we really think that there should be a tighter range of really where healthy people's cholesterol or red blood cell count should be or white blood cell count should be or their, their fasting glucose. We want, an, we want a tighter range where that's healthy and that's a good lifestyle. And so we look at that functional range. Now, it doesn't mean that if you're if you're, if you're outside the functional range, but still within the lab range, that you're sick or diseased. It doesn't necessarily mean that. So realize that um, with these tests, doctors look at it two ways, pathology or function and lifestyle. Uh, once we've done the standard blood test, there's also a standard urine test. It's the UA or urine analysis test. And that's the classic medical test where you pee into a cup and, and send it to the laboratory and they measure it very quickly. And they, they look at, they look for sugar. They look for protein. They look for casts. They look for infectious bacteria. They look for all kinds of things, ketones. And they're looking to see if the urine is healthy from a medical perspective. Um, after those tests are done, your holistic doctor will probably progress to more deep tests that are less traditional as far as orthodox medicine goes, and they're much more functional and much more interesting, uh, quite frankly, because, you know, once a person knows they don't have a pathology, or they do have one or two pathologies, that, but they're under control, then it's very interesting to find out what else is out of balance. And it makes me so curious and so interested to be able to find what is out of balance in someone and be able to, to nudge it back into shape with lifestyle and diet and exercise and supplements and, um, and even mental changes and sleep changes and, and neurofeedback. These are ways, and, and acupuncture and chiropractic, these are all the different ways and, and many more that we can help a person get closer to healthy and closer to ideal and even better function if they're looking for you know, uh, performance. They might be uh, already very healthy and they're aiming for higher performance. And that's a, a passion of mine as well, is to, is to how do we get peak performance out of each individual who wants it, even when they're not sick. So in those cases, these tests are not medically necessary and insurance isn't gonna pay for them because we're not investigating disease. So realize that your insurance company is not um, you know, necessarily being bad. They're just saying, look, what are we here to pay for? We're here to pay for disease and the, the diagnosis of disease, which leads to the treatment of disease. We're not here for all this lifestyle stuff. That's on you to figure out. Well, if somebody intrepid does a, uh, gets a Nobel Prize in, in economics of health, they'll probably start realizing that if we were to do more of this early detection and imbalance detection, we would like the maintenance of any vehicle or any car or any, any machine or any machine anywhere. Um, we already know this, that that makes engines and people and, and machines and animals run longer and run better and cost less in the long run. So if we really are interested in, in decreasing the cost of healthcare, we'll start to pay for this kind of stuff and we'll start to see it has value as we get more literature and information. Uh, as we go deeper with the, the assessment phase, we might order tests of, say, urine function and, and urine tests like organic acid tests. Organic acids are little uh, metabolites of chemicals that are made in your body. They pass through your kidneys and they come out in your urine. And so when we look at an organic acid test, we are looking at the garbage that comes out of your kidneys, which are breakdown molecules that have been broken down from the important molecules that were in your brain or your organs or your guts or somewhere else that were used for something and they've been broken down and left and discarded. It's very analogous to the idea that if a spy was 
going to find out what was going on in a building. They would go to that building's dumpster and look at the waste in the dumpster, and they would look through the trash, and they would look at it and see and infer what was going on in the building that day. Now, it's not perfect, but it's a very good way of saying, well, what did they do in that building? So, likewise, when we analyze urine, we look at the urine organic acids, we, we look at what was wasted and what was left over and what came out in the urine, and we examine those waste products and see how much of them and which ones of them are there, and we can infer what happened in the brain and in the body um, with pretty good accuracy. It's not perfect, but no, no lab test is. Um, and by the way, no good doctor does a therapy based on one lab result or one lab test. And one of the things that we're taught in medical schools and, and chiropractic schools and all these other um, uh, trade, you know, uh, professional schools uh, like optometry school and dental school is um, never treat the lab test, never treat the x-ray, treat the patient. And so that means integrate everything and put it all together. So you don't want to get, you don't want to get blindsided by, by looking at one line item on a lab test and getting consumed by it. You must, must integrate it with all the other lab tests and the physical exam findings and the vitals and, and, and all those different things. So the organic acid test is that really interesting urine test. It tests a whole bunch of things. It tests um, breakdown products of neurotransmitters. It tests breakdown products of things like oxalates that can give us kidney stones and muscular pains and eyeball pains. It tests some um, uh, metabolites of energy production and glucose burning. Uh, it measures fat burning and it measures um, uh, the metabolites of infectious organisms like candida and yeast and bacteria that can live in our intestines. In fact, I like the urine organic acid test better than a stool test for looking at imbalances of gut flora. And let me tell you why. Um, gut flora is... Um, something that these are bacteria and yeasts and fungi that grow in your intestine. And the problem with candida is it, it screws into the wall of the intestine and it doesn't like to come out. And so when you do stool tests, you don't get as much evidence coming out of the stool that you can measure for, um, for analyzing uh, candida fungus. You get much better metabolites because the candida releases chemicals that go into your, uh, their own metabolites. It's like their own little urine. And it goes into the blood, your bloodstream and comes out your kidneys and comes out your urine and you can detect it. And you can say, these are metabolites of fungi. These are metabolites of mold exposure. These are metabolites of candida exposure. These are metabolites of clostridia or other bacteria that live in the gut. So in many cases, strangely and paradoxically, um, urine analysis might be more accurate than stool to figure out what's going on in your intestines regarding bugs and the balance of those bugs, which is called flora and fauna. So um, the, uh, um, the concept of lab testing then moves into things like stool tests. We can certainly test the stool for all kinds of bacteria and fungi and imbalances. We can test it for fecal fat. We can do a number of things with that. And, and we can also do... Um, uh, other specialty tests. One of the specialty tests we look for is histamine in the blood. We look for, um, we have a, a special panel where we look for histamine in the blood, we look for uh, zinc, and we look for ceruloplasmin, which carries copper. And then there's a fourth thing in that, that panel, which we measure from urine, called cryptopyrrole. And cryptopyrrole is a it's a little complicated, but basically to make it simple, cryptopyrrole is a mistake that our bodies make that has to do with um, hemoglobin. We, we make these, in order, to, in order to make hemoglobin, which carries iron, there are several pathways that can fail. And when some of those fail, we make a twisted molecule that ends up circulating in our blood called cryptopyrrole. And this cryptopyrrole can make us feel crazy, and we're not. And it also screws up our metabolism of zinc and B6. So it's very nice to be able to take people that feel quite anxious and feel quite crazy and test them for cryptopyroluria and test them for zinc levels and copper levels and histamine levels because that's a phenomenon. It's a thing that happens with people. In addition to all those tests, there are many, many more, and I, I will stop here because there's just so many tests we can do, but those are just an introduction to some of the lab tests that we do. And now I wanna talk about what we do once we have those lab tests. Once the patient and the doctor are satisfied and the nutritionist and the psychologist and everybody comes together and they're satisfied that they've done enough investigation, they begin to start changing the diet. And sometimes we start changing the diet and adding supplements and taking away foods immediately before we get all the results back from all the labs, and that's, that's okay too. A doctor can help you decide what's safe and what's unsafe to try as far as supplements go, and they can go from least invasive to more invasive as they progress, just like a doctor that prescribes drugs would do. 
So um, one of the first things that I like to do is take away foods. I like to take away foods because that was so important in my younger life. When I was a little boy, um, my family took away certain foods and it made my skin better and a whole bunch of problems got better immediately. And the doctors really couldn't figure it out. And um, I was impressed by the fact that we simply took away foods and I got better. So, um, you know, the common antigens that people suffer from, wheat, gluten, dairy, uh, corn, um, artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, sugar, refined sugar, um, you know, it's all the basic stuff. Um, and then sometimes there are special diets where we, we have a low sulfur diet, we, we reduce sulfur. Sometimes we have diets where we reduce um, uh, pyroles, purines, or pyrimidines. Sometimes we have diets where we reduce um, protein or we increase protein. Sometimes we have diets where we um, increase fat, like the, the keep, uh, um, ketones, where we, where we do that with uh, ketones. Sometimes we have those uh, ketogenic diets. The ketogenic diet is one of the most studied diets in the world. It's been studied in children with, um, with seizure disorder, and it's very effective for controlling all kinds of brain problems. So I, as a chiropractic neurologist, use um, that diet quite a lot in people, but it does require some medical management. It does require some uh, skin prick tests of the blood. Uh, urine is not accurate for, for this. So we look at blood ketones and blood glucose, and we help a person learn how to stay in the right range of, uh, of, ketos, of ketosis. So we give special diets, we take away certain foods, we add certain foods, and then we add supplements. And those supplements are extremely important. Uh, we add things like minerals and proteins, amino acids. We add vitamins and we, and we change the type of vitamins. There are different forms of vitamins out there and some forms of vitamins should be swapped for others. Uh, different people need different forms of vitamins like ester C instead of regular vitamin C or hydroxy B12 instead of methyl B12. This is just two examples of, of the types of changes we might make in a patient based on the chemistry and the genes even. We look at SNP testing, which is single nucleotide polymorphisms. Those are tests of the genes to see what your inheritance is. There might be a person who has um, inherited a particular set of genes, not just one, but a combination of genes that work together to compromise your mental health or compromise your energy production or compromise your detoxification pathways or your sulfur clearance. And so those are well known in the literature and we talk about those and, and do those. So in summation, we do uh, diet and lifestyle, we take away foods, we add foods, we, we give supplements, and, um, and we also very, are very careful to make sure that if we take away foods and add foods, that we get the calories right, that we get the, the macros right, which is the ratio of protein to fat to carbohydrate. We make sure that the patient doesn't um, you know, lose weight if they're not supposed to. We make sure that they lose weight if they're supposed to. And we make sure that they're measuring their quantities with a scale. A lot of patients need to learn to buy a $10 food scale and measure um, their uh, food serving sizes and, and to look at labels and learn to look at how many grams of protein or fat or, or how many grams of fiber are in something. And so while I use all kinds of diets for all kinds of people, I, I'm not trapped by one kind of diet. There are lots of ways that we can help a person. And in fact, there are usually many pathways to wellness. So I don't want you or, or me to get stuck in the idea that one diet is best for everyone because uh, it all depends on what the person's looking for. And in fact, I'll tell you and I'll end on this, I like to mix diets together for people. I will combine a ketogenic diet with a blood type diet that looks at lectins and, um, and, and, um, and we'll also, we'll, we'll look at lectins, which are these little proteins that stick to the intestinal lining and they cause uh, immune responses that are subtle, not, not diseases, but they're, they can lead to diseases like, um, like arthritis and autoimmune diseases. There's all kinds of things that can happen with the lectins that are in food. So, we look at these types of, of adherence where food uh, molecules, food proteins adhere to the wall of the stomach and the wall of the intestine and they wreak havoc, they cause problems. So um, that is the explanation. That's functional medicine. Thank you.